Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Ben Wilder, Director of the Desert Laboratory on Tumamak Hill. And thank you for joining us for our final lecture in the Agave Renaissance series. Um, I am uh, very honored to be speaking to you all again uh, here from Tumamak Hill, known as Atam as Chimamagi Duag, Horn Lizard Mountain on the ancestral lands of the Savaifri and Tonawatam peoples. This volcanic hill is a prominent ancestral, cultural, and sacred significance to the Atam nations, including the Tonawatam Nation, Gila River Indian Community, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, the Akchin Indian Community, as well as the Hopi tribe and the Pascoyaki tribe. The Desert Laboratory recognizes the cultural significance of Chimamagi Duag as the bedrock of our institution and our future actions. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's really wonderful to have you all um, joining us this evening. And, and I hope that this isn't your first lecture. If it is, that's fantastic. Um, all of them are available on uh, the Desert Laboratory website under um, the Agave Renaissance series. So both the lectures and the tasting. So please go there and make sure um, to see the other content that you we presented in this series. And, and I hope like you, um, well, I know that I've sure learned a lot during the series and that really has been the goal. And so I really wanna um, <clears throat> thank our partners and collaborators for this series, uh, Doug Smith of El Crisol and Todd Hanley of Hotel Congress. It's really been fantastic to, um, to continue to scheme all things agave and finding ways to um, perpetuate the, the themes that we're talking about here in, in this lecture. So tonight we're really kind of, it's not possible to tie a neat bow around the series as this that, in which we've covered so many topics and ideas, but we wanted to turn our attention a bit towards the future and to start to <clears throat> really try to get a sense of, okay, how do we put into practice a, a lot of the topics we've been talking about tonight? And, and how do we actualize this to, to carry the legacy forward to, to this is a, as we've been learning, this is a relationship between plants and people that is thousands of years old. And it's been a reciprocal relationship. We've addressed that context. We've addressed um, the archeological history, the cultural history, uh, how many agave species are actually created species through hybridization by that use by people. And We've also addressed a, a lot of the threats that they're facing um, from overexploitation, uh, large corporate interest uh, in the tequila industry that is threatening kind of a more, um, you could say, sustainable or really uh, in step, ecologically in step and bioculturally in step uh, process of, of production. So how do we pull these pieces together and go forward? And so what we wanted to do tonight was really not talk about it so much theoretically, although will of course be some of that, but really to talk about it, what this looks like in practice. And so we uh, could think of uh, really no better folks than having Alex White and Juan Olmedo join us this evening who are uh, undertaking very distinct types of work with agave down, down in Mexico. So uh, that's who you're gonna be hearing from tonight. And then we're gonna uh, be facilitating uh, I'll be moderating a great group discussion and panel at the end that will be pulling in topics from, of course, tonight's lecture, but really trying to pull all over. And I want to remember uh, to remind you all up front that the, this is the penultimate uh, element of the series because tomorrow night, Doug Smith will be leading a tasting with Roberto Contreras of uh, Rancho Tepua, Bacanora and Sonora to, um, to again, just kind of continue with these topics and really looking at what does uh, a, a in-step, ecologically in-step uh, production of agave and bacanora look like right now. So if you have questions for any of the panelists or speakers tonight, put them in the question and answer uh, box there you have. Uh, we will be um, fielding and, and communicating as many of those as possible to our, our presenters. So first I want to introduce Juan Omedo. Juan, uh, feel free to come on and join us. So Juan Olmedo is an agronomist, agroecologist who has been working on farms since 2007. He specializes in the production of maguey, goats, and agua miel, which we'll be talking to us about, 
from Agave Salmiana under the name El Rincón Grande. Juan is based in Hidalgo and has learned from the knowledge of the Puquero agave growers of this region. His efforts focus on the management of agave in agroecological conditions that foster biodiversity as opposed to monocultural models. Juan, thanks for joining us. It's so good to see you again. We were able to meet in person here at the lab in Tucson at the Agave Heritage Festival, I think two years ago. Um, we're itching to have you back up here, but uh, this is this is a close second. So thank you for, for joining us. And um, I'm so, so excited to hear what you have to show with us. Thank you very much, Ben. It's very nice. <laughs> So the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, hello. Well, as Ben said, I'm based in Hidalgo, so that's a little bit northeast of Mexico City. I'm on the Eastern Tierra Madre. That's um, a really biodiverse area because there's uh, rain shadow. Mm -hmm. So I'm at a almost desert area, and then there's forest very similar to the Sky Island. So Arizona, but then there's cloud forest, which gets a lot wetter, just 10 miles from the desert, so it's really rich. There's a lot of different wild agave species. Um, the farm is located in a village called Rincon Grande, which is within a, by, within a, a reserve, a bio, biosphere reserve. It's called Barranca de Mexitlan, and we have about 12 different species of wild agave in the area, in the reserve. A couple of endemic forms that grow nowhere else. And among them, probably the most important is agave salmiana, and that's the one we grow mostly. Um, well, in this photo, you can see how there's columnar cacti, there's trees, there's um, many shrubs, there's and a lot of biodiversity and very little agriculture. There's irrigated agriculture in the bottom of the valley. And then the villages on the hills, like at Rincon Grande, have historically produced uh, maguey, agave salmiana, and sold their pulque to the uh, communities that had irrigation. So in the next slide, you can see some of these agave salmiana. They, they can grow huge, they can grow more than four um, yards tall. Um, in this photo, they are two and a half meters apart and they are taller than they are wider. So all of them are at least three meters tall. They are really huge. They, they grow in a natural surrounding. It's not a monoculture. Each line of agave is about 10 meters between each other. And between those lines, there's trees, there's oaks, there's mesquites, there's cacti, there's barrel cactus, and there's a lot of wildlife. These plants are very important because the soil is very rocky, it's limestone, it's very dry, and the soil is also very thin. So there are very few crops that can be grown commercially. And agave can give you both liquid water and, and carbohydrates. So that's something that is reliable every day of the year. I mean, if you work it well, every, every day you can eat and drink from a day, even in the harshest drought. Uh, we also have some frost in winter. So this agave is frost tolerant, is fire tolerant, is hail tolerant. We have a lot of hail storms in the summer. We've had already a couple this year. And traditionally, they have been used for pulque mostly, but also during pre Hispanic times, there was uh, a lot of agave syrup that was the main sweetener that was used in central Mexico. Then, when sugarcane was introduced by the Spaniards in the 16th century, the use of agave based sweeteners decreased. But the consumption of um, pulque remained and desolate, of course. 
Um, so Magei has always been planted. Um, in the next photo, you can see some of the agave syrup that we produce. This agave syrup is very different from the agave syrup in the supermarket because it's obtained from the sap. So basically, right before this plant sends its shoot, right before it flowers, you have to take off the sensor. And then that allows the sugar to concentrate in the middle part of the agave. And you have to scrap a little layer of tissue twice a day or even three times a day during summer months. And then you get agua miel, which is a lightly yellowish, transparent, thin liquid that is quite sweet. And that can be either fermented into pulque or it can be boiled down to syrup. So we we produce pulque, we've always produced pulque, but pulque, traditional pulque is not pasteurized, so it has a very short, short shelf life, uh, as short as a few hours if it's a hot summer day, a few days if it's winter. Um, so it's hard to sell when you're in a remote location like we are. So we started producing this um, syrup that has dietetic fiber, it has minerals, it's rich in calcium, iron, because it comes straight from the sap, it's not demineralized and it doesn't go through any of the other processes. In the next photo, you can see how some of our agave fields look like. Um, it is not a monoculture and you can see that there's agave of different size. They are planted against the slope, so that prevents erosion and that helps retain the soil, which is extremely important. And the richer the soil, the more water it can hold. So having organic matter and preserving your soil is really key in any farming system, but especially more if you're in a droughty, slopey situation like we are. So these agaves are going great, but then we had the pandemic and this syrup is kind of a niche product. It's, it's expensive if you compare it to more to sugar or the majority of sweeteners. So our, and restaurants closed, so our sales basically stopped. We had to stop producing syrup and saying we didn't know what to do <laughs> because of course the agave are still there. It's not like an annual crop where you can just grow something else. These agave take 12 years on average from planting to maturity. So it's a long term, term investment and not only monetary investment. I mean, you invest your work, your energy, everything. You cannot just chop them down. Plus they're retaining the soil. <laughs> so you really want them there. But then something very interesting happened. Um, because of the pandemic, people care more about what they were eating and there was a boom for locally produced food and drink, and especially for pulque. So instead of drinking beer, which is cheaper and well, not cheaper, it depends, but which is more easily available anywhere in Mexico, a lot of people started to drink um, Pulque, uh, there was, of course, Mexico was treated really badly by the disease. And a lot of people realized that obesity and diabetes, of course, a big issue for Mexico. So consuming very traditional foods like beans and traditional tortillas with native corn and pulque, they have become really popular. So that has not only given us a break, but also that has improve the economy of a lot of producers. I, I mean, there's no data about it, but almost every pulque producer that I've talked to say that they've been doing really well during the pandemic. I mean, in terms of their pulque sales. Uh, for us, selling pulque has a couple limitations. One is that, of course, we're really far away. We are about 45 minutes from the closest town. And then we are, that's like 
an hour away from the state capital, and then the state capital is an hour away from Mexico City. So we're relatively close to Mexico City, but still traveling daily to Sopulque is pricey. So we have to come up with some solutions. So in the next slide, you can see another aspect of the farm. This is not a monoculture, we have animals as well. So goats were already on the farm. There you can see goats and the like like the protective dog, and that's very important because I mean we have puma and coyotes and bobcats, etc. Um, so goats clean the agaves. I mean they weed them, they control weed. Uh, plus their manure is very important for agaves. We add manure to the young ones so they can grow better. And then as they eat the goats, they also leave manure around. So that, that creates a good symbiosis between those two species. And our project was to uh, make cheese, but because of lack of resources, we haven't been able to do it. But we're making barbacoa with these goats, and this came out of the pandemic. There was no fear of what can we do. And then restaurants are closed, so we were we are selling animals every month or so. And then uh, I drive to Mexico City, and I leave it in every house. I mean, I, I get commands, and I go house by house. That way, people don't have to leave their house. They can get their um, barbacoa and their tortillas, which is made from corn that I buy from other local people. and. And, and that has really been working out well. And then there's a new project that came out of the pandemic. In the next slide, you can see uh, two pigs. These are not uh, any kind of pigs. These are Mexican hairless pigs. So they're basically descendants of the pigs that the Spaniards brought in the 16th century. They are the closest to the Iberico pigs from Spain and Portugal. They are about 80% descendants from Iberico pigs, and then the remaining 20% may come from other breeds, either from Europe or from Asia. But they they are really hardy and they can eat agave because they are descendants from these Iberico pigs that eat acorns and grass. They are not adapted to these uh, high grain. Mm -hmm ratio they they actually do very well on fodder so they can eat agave which make them fat because besides fiber they i mean they also have nutrients and they have sterile dye saponins which help them get fat um, their manure is also very good for agave they are they are a very good complement they can receive the direct sunlight, they don't need a lot of protection, they're outdoor breed, um, and they eat agave. So they're basically kind of like a mixture between goat and normal pig. And with them, uh, we're making several products like cochinita pibil, chorizo, and jamón. In the next photo, you can see uh, two hams. So these are the fresh legs of the pigs. So these pigs are grown to until they are about a year old. So then their pigs have a lot of intramuscular fat, then they're curing salt, and then they're mature for two years or something like that. Every little, every ham is different because they are individual pieces. But then that will have the flavor, not only of the grain that they ate, but also the agave and the fodder that they ate. And this is, um, this is the closest it gets to the, again, to the Iberico hams from Spain and Portugal with similar conditions and a very similar breed of pig. And there's been a lot of interest in this new project. So it seems to be doing well, the pigs adapted very well. And then in the last slide, you can see another part of the farm. So there you can see the agave palmiana. 
and you can see how there's mesquite trees. So then mesquite trees, they provide nitrogen for the agave, but also their pot uh, provides food for the bees. Um, and then the goats can eat all the little shrubs around. So that's, that's how versatile agave is, is not uh, like planting GMO soy where you have to grow it with this technological package. Here, you can just adapt. Our main product basically failed because of the pandemic, but the ecosystem is working well, the agroecosystem, so we could adapt thanks to these agaves. And hopefully next year is going to be better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. I, ha I have to be honest, I'm getting hungry hearing about this barbacoa and cochinita pibil that you're making over there. Um, so, okay, I can't wait till the question and answer. I have to ask you about the uh, question about the pulque you have in your glass there. So the increase of consumption in during pandemic times, thinking about the probiotic use, uh, just how good, right, that is for your body. Do you think the clientele is aware of that and that they're going to pulque to just increase their immune system and just go for that? Or is it the alcoholic piece of it more so, or is it both? Or I'm just curious how widely spread that knowledge of pulque and the probiotics being good for you is in for your clientele or those in Mexico. I think part of the clientele is aware of this, but not all of it. Uh, part of the clientele just knows it's good and they know it's good for your body, but they don't really understand what, what's behind it, what's a probiotic. They just know, well, our, my grandma used to drink it every day and she never suffered from diabetes and she died old and healthy. So I think there's both. And I think more and more people are aware of why it is so good. Um, so you have like different kinds of pulque drinkers. You have the traditional pulque drinkers that, well, they have been always drinking it. And then you have these more younger, urban, educated people that know about uh, probiotics and dietary fiber and they are drinking it now, even though maybe their parents didn't drink it. I mean, maybe their parents were the generation that stopped drinking it. Right. And so that, that pulque in your glass right now, how many hours ago did you harvest that from the plant? Okay, so these were seeds that in the morning. So the way you make pulque is um, it's not by batches, but you always have uh, some pulque and then you wash fresh our meal twice a day uh, and you never, I, I mean, you add a one meal and then you extract pulque and then you add a one meal and you extract pulque and that is how it, it works. This one receives fresh our meal about a third of its volume in the morning, about eight o'clock. Uh, mm -hmm. It's pulque fuerte. It's, I like it fuerte. <laughs> if I want it dulce, uh, then it would have received a one meal uh, like three or four hours ago from the evening and cropping. Wow, fantastic. <clears throat> cool. Okay, well, thank you, Juan, and uh, salud. And we will um, be right back. I'll call you back in um, for the Q&A. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Okay, great. So we are also... Uh, really fortunate to have connecting with us tonight um, from Mexico, from Oaxaca. Again, perks of this whole virtual world we've gone into here this last year. Um, and so great, Alex, when feel free to, um, during the intro, come on in. So Alex is the founder and director of Respiram, an artisanal mezcal import project that realizes an agave nursery and profit share practice. Alex started Respiral as a means of creating marketplace inclusion for independent artisans and their traditional spirits that have been traditionally excluded. The project also strives to give importance to economic redistribution, transparency, and ecological responsibility and in international trade. Recently, he has participated in efforts to conserve locally significant agricultural production, in particular native maize varieties, 
and also experiments with the use and recovery of agave materials in natural building. Um, Alex, it's, thank you for joining us this evening. You know, when I was talking with Doug, uh, we were forming this series some months ago, your name came up immediately as we were talking about it. And, and also very much for, um, for this lecture in particular, uh, and just to connect this to the work you're doing and, and how you're thinking about these topics um, for a long time. So anyway, thanks for taking the time to be with us and, uh, and the floor is yours. Alex, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm afraid we're having audio visual issues. So I can see you, but I can't, I'm not getting audio. Something with your internet connection looks like we may have, uh, it may have gone weak. We, you were, before we launched, we went live, it was good, but I, I'm not hearing you right now. Still frozen, unfortunately. So for those in the audience, this is a good opportunity to uh, get a head start on tomorrow night's uh, tasting and to go to your, uh, to your favorite uh, beverage and to, um, and to participate in a little of that. Um, I think Alex is gonna, um, <clears throat> is gonna sign off here for a second and hopefully rejoin us. I think he's coming back. All right. Yeah, I'm back. I'm Buenissimo. Back. There you are. Yeah, the, uh, the computer just totally crashed. Just, hey, it's all right. I had, enough, I had enough of it. <laughs> it's good. Mejor de nuevo. All right, go for it. Yeah, yeah. But but she's she's back. So, anyways, um, uh, yeah, I'm in this village called Santa Maria del Tule. Um, um, and yeah, I got to this village. I had to rent a house actually for, for a project we were doing, which is actually like a book project. It's called, it's called El Tiempo de las Raices. Um, I needed a, needed a house for a couple of Brazilian artists who were coming to work in this book with me. And I found the house in Santa Maria del Tule. Um, and so being in Santa Maria del Tule, I, you know, became a little bit rooted in this, in this town. Um, and uh, kind of this, this nursery project kind of stemmed out of that. Maybe first a little background on, my, on myself. I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts. I've been in Oaxaca for nine years and I've been doing this, um, this practice project which I call Respiral for about um, five years now. Um, so this, this vivero uh, that had the basic objective of, you know, my idea was as one who's commercializing uh, mezcal, um, you know, my idea is that, um, you know, that I, I, I had the responsibility to shoulder some of the, um, the, the ecological and the um, economic burden of, of this industry and um, in representing, uh, I guess, the, uh, the weight and the impacts of consumption. So, you know, originally my idea was just to work with uh, campesino mezcaleros you know, independent uh, autonomous producers, very small scale traditional producers who had some sort of practice of, of, of replanting agave. And in the course of um, making this book, um, I came across the work of a, a lady who's, who's passed away. Her name is um, Katarina Ilsley. And Katarina Ilsley is a woman who essentially dedicated her life to working with um, Campesinos, essentially, you know, traditional peasants 
uh, all throughout Mexico in, in terms of managing agave and um, you know, reproducing agave from seed. Uh, she was amazing, I think, in, uh, in her language and you know, how, how she wrote in, in very simple but eloquent words that were accessible to the everyday person, not just the professional or the academic or you know, the, the elite class. Um, and her, yeah, her, her, her texts were, were amazing. And so I included one chapter in, in this book um, called uh, The Agave Management Plan. The Agave, Agave Management Plan essentially speaks of, um, of the idea of uh, preserving and managing agave populations just as much as you would um, forest populations. So I think her, her work was so good, her, te her text so simple yet um, communicative um, that in, in, in inserting a piece of her, her, her work in this book, you know, it, it became very visual very quickly. And that's when, uh, for me, I kind of set out on this idea of like, well, I can, you know, I can, I can do this. It doesn't have to be just a, a concept, right? This was never, this was never conceptual. This is this is all practice. You know, this text refers to actions. It doesn't re it doesn't refer to you know reflection. Um, and so, in this town of Santa Maria del Tule, um, I then went down the course of understanding kind of land land tenure here, as I started to look for a piece of land um, that I could use, um, you know, to to create this nursery in, um, which was, I think, equally important. Um, what you know, what I learned through finding a piece of land that is, is not private land, but it's, it's a, what's called a Hilo land, which means it's, it's a land that um, belongs to the municipality. It can only be used for uh, agricultural uh, use. It's kind of protected from outside speculation. It's, it's protected from um, residential speculation. So the idea is that the land almost stays non-monetized so that every day even um, you know, self-sufficiency type agriculture can can continue as a culture and as a way of life. So, found that uh, the municipality was really nice. They lent me this piece of land that um, had been abandoned for for quite some time. Um, before the piece of land was it was it had been used for 20 years for a uh, you know a agricultural moder modernization project, which was um, you know it was all about intensifying um, maize production with you know, herbicides and, and fertilizers. So the, the land we found was, was quite contaminated to be honest, but um, you know, over time we started creating this vivero. And the way this vivero works is um, essentially I, I take, collect seeds from different mezcaleros who I, I know or I work with or people who I know work with um, or seeds that you know I may come across, um, really with an eye out for the most endemic um, variety varietal out there that really is kind of in risk or in, in danger uh, of being lost. Um, and there, I should add a note that you know, different from where Juan is in Oaxaca, there's you know an enormous biodiversity of agaves. Um, I'd say you know more than 30 types of agave are used for mezcal and you just travel maybe four hours up north to Puebla and those numbers are reduced to four or five varietals. So this is really uh, kind of like a cuña, like a, like, a, like a nest of biodiversity in terms of agave. And it's certainly something that is, is fascinating. It's, uh, it's a source of pride. And I think if you um, look at biodiversity as a, a value you know, intrinsic to itself, it's, it, it's amazing and it's um, something that's pretty interesting to, to work to support. Um, so from this, from this vivero, every year we have uh, cycles of agave. This is a perfect photo. Um, so this is probably, um, you know, seeds typically go down after, uh, the, the, this is one lot, there's another lot, but after these the two lots are, are cleared of agave, which is in the rainy season, which, you know, we're kind of in the beginning of rainy season right now in May. So anywhere between you know July or August, new seed um, is put down. And, and this photo that you're seeing, these are probably agaves that this is probably the month of um, I'd say I'd say February or March where they start to get to a decent size. So the way this practice works is you know you're just looking at at beds, but you know behind every 
every one of these beds, all these agaves, little by little, uh, are coordinated to go to different parts of Oaxaca, um, all different regions. Um, one hour, two hour, three, four, five hours away, uh, some into a little bit more tropical climates, some into high altitudes um, where the agaves will adapt and they will evolve in their own way to the lands. Um, and so, so that, that this really is the idea is, um, uh, is, is handing these agaves over to, to different mezcaleros and they take them and then they, they trans, transfer, transplant them into different lands that, that they manage um, whether they're private, whether they're ajido, whether they're, they're communal lands. Um, and a really interesting uh, thing I see often is a lot of consumers or people that know of this project, they immediately have the idea that these agaves are gonna be used for the mezcal that's, that's commercialized. And um, it's, it's interesting to, to see that, I think in, for US consumers, it's, it's almost abstract or strange, uh, the idea of, um, of kind of gifting them, right? I think the idea is typically that you know you're growing this; it's, it's your it's your property. Uh, but the way this works, and it's kind of also what I've just learned by living here and being in this culture um, with these people, is that um, it's not necessarily like that. And it's you know in in a place where you have multi generations passing down lands and agave and um, you know. Uh, I guess cultivated nature to to their to their sons to their grandchildren to their daughters, uh, you realize that there is a, a larger understanding of what it means to kind of pay something forward, and you know um, a basic understanding that what you're harvesting or what you're cutting um, is the result of a lot of time, and that it's not quite as quick and direct as as property would lead you to think from start to finish. Um, in terms of from seed to an agave. So all these agaves, um, you know, you're, you're looking in this, there's probably six or seven bridles right here. Um, this is half of, this is the, well, this is the same lot at a different uh, point of time, but there, any, a cycle is essentially 30,000 agaves and, um, and the agaves can take anywhere from seven to 25 uh, years to harvest. So, yeah, so right now, um, you know, I'm coordinating with different mezcaleros who will come and take certain agaves and it's always kind of like a, a little puzzle thinking about which agaves do well in their micro region. Um, and then in coordinating, you know, taking them out or, uh, you know, it's always a last minute thing when there are rains um, because it's, it's very important that there be moisture, that there be rain for the agaves to um, to, to have root growth, you know, to take in their, in their new lands upon transplant. That's probably the, the largest, um, the largest obstacle or, or challenge in general to agave is, is, is rains. I mean, I think a lot of people have this idea that you just stick it in the ground and then you come back 20 years later and, and that's it. But it's, it's not like that at all. This is actually really, um, you know, this is, this is agriculture. Um, this is, you know, semi semi domesticated agave, but they they require uh, a lot of care, mostly in a lot. I mean, especially in, in this ages of getting them up to up to a size in which they can then, you know, leave this hotel of sorts and, and go to the campo where, you know, then they may have to go through long periods without rain or just you know extended extended strong strong sun. Um, so. Um, and uh, so I guess I, I began to mention this, uh, the idea of um, ejido lands. And this is, this is a land that the municipality has, has lent me for this. And I'm taking care of it, you know, we're regenerating the soils. Um, we have lombri composta, which is lombris, which is earthworms that we're slowly trying to um, integrate into this land. And, you know, we're, we were bringing in a lot of different manures. Um, to, to, you know, to, to improve the, the soil and, and little by little, you know, we're starting to be able to use cover cropping and, um, and, and compost from this, this same land to start to, um, you know, reduce the amount of inputs we need from outside and um, to increase its own, like um, its own microecology of, um, you know, this land producing to feed itself. So 
we're I think in the fourth year now. So this is, this Vivero has really come a long way. Um, in the beginning, it was really just, uh, in the beginning it was, was, we were watering these agaves with, you know, pails of water. And then slowly we we're able to put in this, I was able to put in this irrigation system. I was able to uh, find someone in this town who would, um, who would be kind of a caretaker and start to have this under control, start to understand this. I mean, I'm not a, uh, an ecologist, I'm not an agrarian, I'm like an urban planner and an artist. So it was, it was fascinating to learn this, but it was, you know, was learning that I had to do before I could understand how to, how to manage something like this. Um, but so the agaves are kind of, they've been under, really under control for a, a couple of years now, this whole system of cycles. And that leaves us time to kind of focus on, um, you know, trying to practice, live, and also exhibit what agave is part of, which is a, a larger, just, you know, um, larger local food system, which means I think as, you know, um, Juan alluded to not, you know, non-monoculture practices. And I think if you're really gonna, uh, if you're really living like a local food system, then you're not just focusing all your time on one thing. You're kind of respecting the, the natural limitations of, of that plant or crop. And instead of trying to intensify things or accelerate things, you just are kind of recognizing the need for pause, um, the time for rest. And during that time, you, you, you focus on other things. So, you know, we have a different mil milpas going in here, and that's also um, representative of, of most most mezcalero producers, um, you know, who, who who kind of embody um, agave and mezcal culture. So this is this photo is from last week. This is uh, the, the person's whose face you see is someone who works with um, Simeon in his village in uh, San Agustina Matengo, and um, this is this is kind of how it works, you know, I call up Simeon and, you know, this year I wanted to give a lot of, a lot of agave to Simeon because he's, he's young. And, um, you know, this agave you see in front of you is Aroqueño. So that's probably gonna take anywhere between 12 and 15 years to grow. And while in my thinking, this is really for Simeon who's now, let's say 48 years old. So let's say when he's 64 or so, you can say, okay, he can harvest it. That, makes it makes sense but in his head this is all for his for all for his daughter all for his kids and i think um that that's been interesting to understand like um you know that's what a, you know traditional agrarian culture is 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 really respecting these timelines um and and seeing uh nature kind of as um a resource and um an inheritance um so so simeon took maybe uh, I, don't, I don't know, this whole bed of, of aroqueños. Um, and, you know, and the, the way it works, you know, we had, we had another, village, another uh, kind of errand to run and they needed to bring some mezcal to me. So we took advantage of that trip because, you know, gasoline costs money. Um, and, you know, gasoline is, is an expense, extremely expensive resource down here for better and for, you know, for worse. Um, but so that's, this is kind of, you know, coordinating these trips. And, um, and I think this year we have like five or six other beds of, of Tobala, which we know do really well in San Agustina Metengo and um, Jabali, which um, Simeon produces mezcal from, but he's never, he's never actually uh, cultivated it, uh, which, is, which is also interesting, you know, in my little brief little passage through this, you know, ancient, multi-generational culture, you know, I'm, I'm getting to live this moment in which I get to see mezcaleros, you know, farming and cultivating uh, these otherwise wild agaves for the first time. So, um, you know, I'd say even three years ago, the idea of, for a lot of these producers who I know and work with, the idea of working with seed was very, was very rare. Um, and, and now it's, it's interesting to see how open producers are to, you know, to, to having more and more stock of all these different otherwise, um, you know, and, and endemic agaves. So, um, so yeah, this will be, you know, the, the first time planting uh, Jabali and, um, and Tobala and Araqueño, I think he has, you know, plenty of, um, and it'll probably, 
you know, be, I don't know, five, six, seven thousand agaves that he, he puts in and then in the ground. And then that's kind of, um, yeah, resources for him and his family and, and just his town in general uh, moving forward because what agave means when it's in the ground is that then you need to invest in people who are going to be taking care of it. So in a way it's, it's um, you know, it's just furthering a traditional economy. Uh, maybe it's a good point to mention, you know, what ejido land means. Um, in the case of this project, ejido land means that I don't have to monetize these agaves. Um, it means I can, I can gift them to producers and I think in turn, as a producer receives the, the agave as, as a gift, um, you know, it's, it's, still, it's still a lot of work to receive them, to put them into the ground, and then to tend to them for many years. But I think what it does is it, it, it gives mezcaleros, and I think people in general, the opportunity to, to, to view them as plants and not have to go to the extreme of, of commodifying them and really looking at, okay, well, we need to get this out of the ground quickly. You know, we, you know, we gotta get, you know, we have to accelerate things, you know, I think, you know, ideas that have led, I think our, our Western ways, you know, productivity and efficiency have led us to, in ways kind of a poison food system, to be honest. Um, it, it's amazing to see these other systems of land tenure, which have their, which have their issues in terms of generating, um, money to support families. But I think in terms of the health of the land, in terms of if I were to ask these plants uh, what they think, uh, I think these plants would be really happy with, with this system because it's much less intensive. It means we can use compost. It means if uh, an agave is not large enough to transplant, we can just let it sit there for another year. There's no rush. And I think that's, uh, and, and, that, and, and that experience, you know, allows me to understand a little bit when I, you know, I look at a, um, a mezcal that I bottle, for example, and I see that an espadina has been in the ground for 10 to 12 years. And what that means, the 10 to 12 years, uh, which for a consumer is a luxury, um, what that means is that that producer has that flexibility because they have control over that land and they probably get it at a, at a good price if it's private or simply they have rights to it because they're part of that, that town. Um, so I think, of course, as a product, it then um, equates to an exquisite complexity, an exquisite flavor. Um, but uh, it's interesting to see that that flavor, that um, you know, that quality doesn't come from a modern process. It doesn't come from industrialization. It doesn't come from accelerating things. It comes from, in a way, the demonetization of land, the demonetization of agaves, that's what gives people the, the flexibility to be able to work them in these ways. Um, and so these types of values, which I think I've learned over the course of um, my years working with these mezcaleros, which has been uh, really interesting to kind of enter into to their world. I mean, you know, I'm from New England, uh, these worlds so-and-so don't, don't exist according to my education, according to where I grew up in. So to see these, these other worlds, ways of doing things, not as ideas or concepts or, um, you know, uh, reflections, but as ancestral and uh, continuing um, is, is pretty amazing. Uh, what's also clear is that, you know, despite there being always elements of, of corruption in land and uh, issues of power, that this, this type of land is really in, in defense and actually amazing um, to be here in Mexico where there is, where there was an agrarian reform and, and where small scale agriculture like this can exist. Um, this project has led me to understand that the maices of where I'm from in Massachusetts um, have originated from here that uh, you know, they worked their way up the, the East Coast of the United States in the 1700s and slowly evolved and were traded uh, up North and, 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 and landed kind of, the Milpa landed in Massachusetts where I'm from, I think in the 1600s or so. So uh, you know, my history uh, of my lands comes from, comes from Oaxaca. And so I, I set out actually to try to to try to, to try to create something like this in a small parcel of land in Massachusetts, you know, 
what would be seen as a lawn, right? Or what would be seen as like a, a private property. And it was really interesting because I, I put in a lot of effort and I put in, I think, you know, years of constancy in trying to make it happen. But despite there being all this land, I was really amazed that even, uh, you know, land trusts or organizations that were supposed to be set up to, you know, preserve um, agriculture or to preserve ecology, that what they're really preserving in their mind is, in their mind is um, historic preservation or an agriculture um, as it existed by the white colonists. And uh, that was really interesting to, to see in the question, you know, that why and how could it be that, you know, all the generations of, um, uh, of, of land history and, and, and the culture of these crops be just totally decimated simply because they, they came before the arrival of, um, of European colonists. So that's, um, that's kind of a project I, I, I put on for hold and I'm really just, I guess, happy to, to be here um, and to continue to learn in this way about, um, you know, managing uh, crops and, and, and growing kind of these, these different crops that are, that are animate, that are not seen as, um, they're not seen as property, they're not seen as static, but they're seen as, as animate, they're seen as alive. And um, uh, the, the histories of, um, of where these agaves or maices came from are also really alive. And that's it's really a, an interesting lesson to try to find ways to bring into um, uh, you know, a commercialized product such as the one I'm, I'm doing through uh, Respiral. So I think that's it. Fantastic, thank you, Alex. <clears throat> hey, before you go, actually, I have a, a quick question and I'm gonna ask you to hang around for the, um, for the question and answer. The, are you, have you gotten to the point where people are showing up with seed, with agave seed, and either that was given to them or that they found some plants that had particular traits they wanted or that they're just bringing them to you to, to grow out? Um, no, but yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a few people I, I, I work with who, yeah, who if they do have seed, um, they, you know, they will approach me and, you know, there's someone down the street who I know they grow agave and I, you know, it was raining and we, I didn't have any seed and he was happy to give me bags of seeds. So um, it's, it's flexible, but, you know, it's not like a public space. People see it. And I think even in the town, a lot of people have, not a lot, but, you know, a handful of people have been starting to grow agave from seed just because here, what works great is that people see something and they'll, they, they copy it um, because it is an agrarian culture, a traditional culture. Um, so, and people are already doing these types of things. So it's, it seems to have uh, caught on with, with a handful of people who are now growing agave um, in El Tule. And Tule, you know, it's not to make mezcal here, but you know, you can, you can sell it per the kilo. So it, it can become like another, another little, um, you know, income. For a family. I'm curious too, so we've talked a lot of in, in the series about the different um, reproductive strategies of agave, but then also the pollination and the connection with bats and bat for the mescala and all that. So I, I'm curious with your work about uh, harvesting of pups or if any of the species you work with produce uh, bulbos, uh, the plants on, on the stock, or if you're just focusing on seed primarily. I mean, um, to be to be honest, I don't really have that much of a luxury, um, you know. To you know, it's not like I'm getting paid to do this, um, and it's not like. And I think for any of the mezcalero who gets me seed, it's also time out of their day, so it's, you know, it's kind of always scrapping by. It's always barely. It's always just doing, doing, doing really enough to make sure you have, uh, you know, 30, 30 beds of, of a biodiversity and it can, it can come about any which way. Yeah, I've, I've put bulbillos in the ground. There's actually, actually a cupriata, a cupriata from Michoacan down the street. And so, and I've seen that it has bulbillos. So it's also in a way for me like mapping, you know, there's a coyote up in the, up in the hills that I know has seed and, 
Uh, there's another hybrid as seed. So it, it's, it's, it's also managing things like that, right? I know that, you know, uh, Berta Vasquez, who's a mescaler I work with, I know she may have seed, but then I know how she is. So, you know, it's all these, all these different things that kind of come into the, the equation of putting like a cycle, a cycle together. It's not structured, it's not straightforward. And, um, but it, you know, it, it always seems to work out in one way or another. I'm thinking of uh, Jesus Garcia who joined us for uh, one of the uh, presentations in, in the series. And Jesus is always going around town looking to see which uh, agaves may be putting up um, stocks of the harvest for for roasting um, that they do at Mission Gardens. It's, and it comes about through word of mouth, through friends, pictures on Instagram, whatever. And it, you just kind of piece it together. Yeah, um, I mean, first to be honest, first is, is getting the agaves out. Um, you know, and as, as they start to go out, I think that's when, you know, I start to think more about like, you know, really having to, okay, it's time to really go get all these seeds, you know, but I have two bags of seeds and it's really a, like, a, like a, a balancing equation. Um, you know, I know that in three weeks, I'm gonna take about four beds of, misca, of agave down to Simeon. And so we're, we already have in our minds, okay, we're gonna prepare those beds and which ones are we gonna use for these Toyota seeds. And, um, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a game of timing, but, um, but, and they've gotten a lot better at it because the, the sooner, the sooner you get the seed in after um, transplanting the agave, the larger they're gonna be next year and a better chance they'll have to, to be able to go straight into the campo. Um, if they're not large enough, you know, what I do is typically transplant them to a producer and oftentimes we'll put them just right next to their homes because if they're small, they require, you know, more need, um, more watering, and they'll probably be in, in the, that bed for another year before they're transplanted again to the, um, uh, to the fields. Um, yeah, and the and nice thing is, you know, I, sometimes I work with new, new producers and, and, and the idea is that it's, it's really about supporting these small scale producers that for the most part really don't have a shot at competing with these large brands and companies that have, you know, politics behind them, they have resources behind them, but they produce a super inferior product by design. Um, and they're not producing a cultural product, they're producing a commercial project or a commercial product. So it's, it's also having an eye out to, to see if I can you know, support those families because for them, that means you know, having resources in their hands. It means having control over their own agave, uh, not having to be susceptible to price increases in agave if they have to buy it um, you know, from market, which is their town or outside of their town. And I think it also means just having the pride of growing your own agave. There's at several points in your in, in your presentation, in your words today, I've, I've found parallels to what Paul and Susie Fish uh, described to us on the archaeology of, of agave fields uh, um, in the 1,000, 1,500 years ago here on, in the Tucson Valley in Tumamak Hill. And one of those is the generational nature of the of the of the plants and that these are for the next generation planting and that, that knowledge that spans uh, different lives. Uh, that, that's a, a consistent piece. And then the other is, the, is the, just the knowledge of how to grow the plants, right? That you, Paul and Susie shared just what you said about starting with much larger individuals when you plant them out on the rock piles um, because then they have a head start and they get going and much faster. So the, the archeological work that Paul and Susie presented, which is findings, um, you know, really of centuries past, I am hearing a lot of reverberation and connection in the, in the, wor in the work you're doing today, which is, which is cool. At this point, I would, I would love to uh, bring back in Juan to join us. And then I'd also, um, it would be great, Doug, if uh, you can join us as well for the question and answer period. Um, we can really get this conversation up to even another level. So great. I'm gonna, uh, let me start. Um, and then please for all those in attendance, uh, put in your questions and answers to your questions. We'll give you the answers uh, into the chat box and we'll start feeding the, those in as well. So, you know, whoever wants to field this one first, please go for it. Um, 
you know, how did you identify what was needed to accomplish the work you were doing in terms of getting started? And, and maybe Alex, I'll, I'll go to you first with that because, you know, when you, yeah, like what, what was literally the seed or what, what did you see that was the gap? I was like, okay, this is where I need to, my entry point. Thank you. Um, what was the, the entry point? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I have a background kind of putting projects together from scratch for a long time. So I, I kind of had that in my back pocket. Um, but I think it was also that I, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I have to just speculate, you know, maybe, maybe I got energy through just the, the idea of, of doing it. Um, but I think I also felt that, that there was, you know, some decency to, to, to be achieved from, yeah, just taking, just, you know, just being, being true to the idea of just assuming some of the responsibility. I mean, it was, it was in, that, in that case, it was very straightforward. You know, you're, you're selling mezcal, uh, you know, mezcal requires a, a chopping of, of agaves and unless you replant them, you know, that's gonna go, you know, it's like, it's like salmon, you know, if you don't, you just eat salmon and there's no fish farms, then you're just gonna, you know, decimate the population like we've done everything else. So um, it also occurred to me that, you know, this is, a, this is a pretty small effort. I think it's a pretty small uh, field. And, you know, you produce 30,000 agave every year, which is, which is not little, you know, even uh, in, in terms of a landscape, I think it would cover quite a bit of landscape. And in terms of kilos, I mean, you multiply 30,000 times, let's say 50 kilos, each and it's um in terms of production i think it, it, it covers uh the agave needed to produce you know a lot of mezcal so it feels decent as just also just you know paying that forward um because for me yeah all agave all mezcal that i'm commercializing is you know off the backs of people's work in the in the past you know managing land so yeah it, was, it wasn't very complicated and i think living in a place like this where you're surrounded where it's still like traditional agrarian culture. It's not like uh, me trying to do it in Massachusetts where you're on an island and people don't know what you're doing. People here know what you're doing. Um, it's very easy to kind of fall in step with, with uh, other agrarian um, customs and practices here. So in a way, it was um, yeah, pretty straightforward. Juan, I'm curious for you, when you know you spend some time here in the United States, you experience, you work on a lot of different farms around when it was, when you decided to, okay, now I'm ready to do my thing. Where, where, you know, how did, what was like the first pieces you put together? Where'd you start? Um, and then just make sure you're on mute. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so for me, it's like, I knew my family had this piece of land so I had to do something that could go well with this piece of land. So agave was an obvious choice because it's something that already goes there that everybody around grows. And then there's of course a lot of possibilities with uh, agave. And I was playing first, I thought about decimate. Um, like, I mean, it cannot be called mezcal because it's not within the mezcal denomination area. Uh, then, of course, pulque. Um, and then I thought about syrup, basically, because I saw it as something that was growing, is not alcohol, and, and it's not perishable. Um, but, you know, seeing what has happened, it's probably not the best <laughs> product I could come up with, because, um, I mean, Producing it, especially producing it this way, is expensive, so it's still very niche. Um, and then, well, the other product, like the pig, it just, I mean, I have always liked pig, and, and then I tried to do some ham, and I mature it for almost a year. And then right, like the same week when I had to stop uh, producing the syrup the same week I managed to cut the ham that I had been aging for a year. So then that was like the eureka moment. And then was like, if I could get these recipes, they could also eat agave. So that was kind of like something that happened 
in a moment when I try that time. Um, but I mean, for the few of my uh, business projects and everything and things didn't work out as planned. So sometimes the processes are not as straightforward as you might think. Yeah, yeah. Doug, I'm curious from your perspective, you know, uh, when you made the expansion from coffee focus into Mescal and here in Tucson in particular and saw where the knowledge base was of the kind of in general community where getting the product that you wanted to focus on that, what, what was your starting points and yeah. Talk about not straightforward. Uh, um, I'm from Phoenix, so obviously my life is, you know, is not embedded in agave culture other than to, you know, have seen it on the landscape in Phoenix and Tucson and other places my whole life. Um, you know, my first real connection to agave and mezcal was at my first field site when I was doing dissertation research in anthropology, and that was in southern Mexico. Um, and it was, wasn't really mezcal that interest, interested me so much, and that was like 1990, so that was prior really to the whole mezcal boom, and so I wasn't really aware so much of mezcal traditions at the time. I was just more interested in land use and indigenous rights um, and how those two came together at that field site down in Guerrero. Um, and then I was introduced to the intricacies of mezcal culture and its various dimensions, which of course fascinated me and has kept me fascinated ever since. Then it was quite a few years between that point and, and this. Um, I was an academic for 10 years, would engage in mezcal and agave every now and then in my teaching. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's my history as a borderlands person that I think really matters maybe more than, more than anything. And I'm, I'm really interested in arid lands. I'm really interested in climate change adaptation in arid lands in particular. And it's just become clear to me that agave is going to figure really centrally um, as, as a plant in a, like what Alex was talking about, sort of a slower production regime, slower, more local economies. Um, there's, there's a patience in agave growing and a patience in, a, in mezcal production. Maybe that's the best word I can think of. There's sort of a just a patience that is required um, that, that, that turns us away from the accelerated pace of economic systems that we're so used to. And I think that's just going to have to be more and more important in the future. And so it was just sort of natural to go from that kind of you know, feeling in my soul or that philosophy to a return to Mescal um, in terms of you know, stuff that I wanted to promote um, in my own business, um, cultures that I wanted to support in my own business, small producers that I wanted to support in my own business. And so it's, it's really in that context that I made the acquaintance of Alex and Juan. Um, and you know, these are the personalities, the, these are the projects that have really enriched my own life and, and, and fleshed out my own commitment to, to agave and, and all of its different aspects. I love that each of you, their natural next steps, right? They're just they're what, from your ethos, from your, what you're wanting to create and it, you know, it was just there. Um, so kind of touching on a little bit what you saw there, Doug, and talking about what's coming next. So this series has given, a, 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 we've talked a lot about it, I've gotten a fairly clear picture of the dynamic and evolving agave production that seems poised to develop even more so in the coming decade and, and plus. So we've talked a lot about um, indigenous and rural traditions and, and the biocultural, the cultural elements that sustain these relationships and, and that, that, that really on the ground knowledge base. So what should be prioritized? So the indigenous and rural people who are the traditional keepers of cultural knowledge and agave cultivation are included in and benefit from the developments and the expanding kind of mescal agave boom. If, yeah, I'll go to you, Doug, first, if you uh, want to start us off there. Yeah, I, I think it's a complicated question. It's, you know, there, there are different paths that people are already taking and some of them 
um, I would say like Alex's and Juan's uh, are, are, are perfectly sane and that's the way we should be moving. But I think there are always threats and you know, I don't, I don't want to beat up the tequila industry, but it's typically held up as even among, you know, the most progressive tequileros, you know, that, that system is, has made mistakes, right? Giant industrial monocultures, a lot of land use or land conversion from, you know, multi, multi cropping or milp agriculture to, to industrial monocultures. And, um, you know, in, in, in the region that I'm most familiar with, which is Sonora, there really is this kind of, do we do this or do we do that? There's, 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 you know, when it comes to sustainability of Bacanora production in Sonora, there is, you know, a, a real worry among a lot of people that we're going to move in the industrial direction in order just to supply plants for the Bacanora industry as it needs to grow, right? So I would say, of course, it's not going to surprise anyone in my own mind. Um, what we really need to do, this is a complicated political and economic question. It's a political, it's, it's a legal question. You know, how, how do we maintain doing agave culture the right way? How do we support that? How do we keep people on their land? You know, how do we keep from moving from you know, a, a healthy agricultural system or agroecological system to a less healthy one. And, you know, there's, those are questions that I become, I think become sharper all the time. Juan, I'm curious your thoughts on, on this topic and what I was really struck by and what you shared with us with your words were just the, you know, you, you've, been, you've been really um, pivoting in, in rapid time and diversifying the work you're doing. And I'm just thinking curious uh, how that experience of the last year connects with what you see going forward. And again, how we have, you know, working with the, within the landscape you do there, um, maintaining the, the knowledge bearers. Yeah, I think, well, this piece came out of necessity. And well, it's happened to many people around the world because it's an initial year, so you have to do it makes choices that you wouldn't normally make. Um, but I mean, I think in a period of crisis like this one, it's a health crisis and economic crisis, then did you realize how fragile is this uh, industrial and economic system that we live in? And you cannot, I mean, there's people that think that, well, this is just a crisis, it will. Uh, but you know, there's always going to be more crisis coming. So I think we should see for diversity, not only in farming systems, but also in food, in economic systems, everything. If we go for this hardcore monoculture, capitalistic mode. I mean, that's not how we're going to solve the trouble that it's created. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful. I see that more and more people are realizing that this is not the path that we should be doing. Of course, I mean, if you own a large tequila industry, you're, you have to you have to try to keep with this view because there's no way you can transition. But I mean, that's just a very really small percentage of the people who are in that situation. Most of us, we live winter lives. We have uh, much we struggle, we have to struggle day to day. And I mean, that, that's usually a weakness, but that can also be a strength. We can, I mean, everybody has different choices, but and limited, but I feel like a lot of people are trying to move away from this industrial mode of farming and eating. And, and it has to be an integral part, you cannot, uh, make our teeth on the cow and then pair it with Wonder Bread, of course, right? So <laughs> this is just, I mean, agave and mezcal is often seen as a niche thing. And, and that's why many of the changes are more obvious here, but I think uh, it's part of a larger question. I mean, right now in Mexico, we are 
struggling with the prohibition of drugs for sale, and then uh, Monsanto suing against this prohibition. And I mean, who's gonna win again? Uh, we don't know, but uh, we can strike for Mirta and biodiversity and small scale everything. What you're describing is, I think, one of the best definitions of resilience you could have, right? That, that is, I think, it becoming, um, it's an important word and we're seeing it a lot, but I think some, we're losing, we're risking losing the, the real meaning of what that looks like on the ground. And I think you're describing it right there, having the robustness of your system that have to be able to pivot uh, as conditions change around you. Um, and I think the agave system is naturally set to that. Alex, was there anything you wanted to add on to the, the question of kind of uh, supporting the knowledge bearers and the cultural holders of, uh, of some of this work? Oops, I think we've lost hey. your audio again. I, I, would re I would reinforce the point that, that Juan just made. Um, I, you know, com consumers are part of the system and consumers have a lot of power. And so consumers need to make the right choices and therefore they need to be educated. So consumer education is a critical part of this, I would say. And so it's really incumbent on people like me to be doing that education to enable people to understand what that product is versus that product and which product to support. Mm -hmm. Alex, unfortunately, we're not hearing your audio. Um, I'm going to, while we hopefully get you reconnected, I'm gonna jump to the next a question. This is from Robert Villa. And he's curious about the extent of deforestation attributed to agave cultivation in, in concentrated centers of biodiversity, um, such as Oaxaca or other places in Mexico. And he just wants to clarify, he's not necessarily pointing to small scale producers, but just kind of understanding the rate at this monte and, and the, and for the planting of agave. Juan, what's your sense of that? So yeah, that's that's a real issue. Uh, in Mexico, the first real agave boom that we had is tequila. So then when people started consuming mezcal, a lot of um, growers, sellers, etc., they just thought, okay, we can replicate this in many other states of the country. And sadly that's been happening. Um, happily, there's a lot of uh, alternative projects like Alexis and, and thousands more that are trying to do it differently. There's uh, the Maestros Mezcaleros Tradicionales that are growing uh, wheat, I got it with their milpa. But yeah, that's, uh, that's still, I mean, the forestation is still a big issue. Uh, the, the board is still dominated the Mezcal County or whatever by large money interest. Um, so I think now it's consumer pressure that can change that. Uh, I mean, in the last few years, there's been some attempts by the big industry to limit the production of small scale uh, agave and that has uh, hit them back really hardly because uh, consumers and people who like agave realize that this is not what agave is. So then in, they've been giving uh, their promotion to small case consumers and by attacking them. So, I mean, I think we need to give more information to, to consumers and to people and to producers and that way uh, we can have a better farming system. Alex, the, the question, um, just do a quick sound check. Can you hear? Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, very good. Okay. So the question is uh, about the kind of desmonte that's happening in biodiversity hotspots such as Oaxaca or other places for the cultivation of, of agave. And if you've seen, um, so how much clearing, concentrated efforts of clearing, is that on the uptick? Where Where is that at? What's your your sense of the, the, the trajectory there. Yeah, for, first I wanted to comment on what uh, Doug said. You know, I, I think, I do think 
I do think, you know, of course, consumer education or consciousness is a large part of this, but I think, I think the consumer by definition is very limited to how conscious you can become in the act of consuming, right? Um, but, where, but I do think it's very important. I do think that the, uh, the other part that would maybe actually take um, people towards a better understanding of you know, indigenous lands and values is, is, is by, by you know, developing the sensibilities to a plant. Um, you know, I feel that a, a consumer, if, 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 they, if they can't look at their landscape and if they can't feel history, if they can't feel any continuance, um, if they can't feel that it's an animate being, if they look at landscape and nature and plants as static things, I don't, I don't know that the information on the back of a bottle really means anything. I think words only mean, mean something when they're tied to, 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 to emotions or values or, or ethics, you know? Um, so I think, I think if, if, you know, I think if there were to be like a, a growth in, in, in the sense of the, the sensibilities of people there, then I think things would shift automatically without even a need for, for words. I think it, it seems like it's very much more of a, a psychological work that needs to be done or like a psycho-spiritual work that needs to be done than, than an informational one. Um, that's not to ne negate what you said, Doug. I just think that my experience, um, you know, it's where I'm doing this profit share I kind of as an experiment to see how people react to the idea of giving 30% profit to, um, to producers, right? How do distributors re re react? How do consumers react? How do stores react? And also the, um, um, the, the replanting. Um, and not, not to be cynical by any means, but um, it, it's kind of experiment in progress and I'm, I'm seeing kind of how it's interpreted, right? Um, and that's another thing. You can put out information there, but it's interesting to see how people interpret it. Uh, the sec I guess the second question about um, deforestation for agave, I think that's absolutely been, it seems like that's the standard is precisely that, you know, deforesting for agave. And um, for me, I've been hung up, I've been hung up over the years of this idea of, you know, reforestación de maguey, which is reforesting with agave. And technically it's correct because, you know, an arid, forest is of succulents and agaves and maybe some brush but um but when trees go down and a lot of you know cactuses are um are going down to make make land for agave then that's just monoculture practice right so i think that monoculture practice is definitely the standard and i've seen over the years swaths of land uh, be visible from afar because they've been cleared for agave um and yeah, and, and, and transplanting with you know seven, eight different families, I've been pushing kind of the the idea of agroforestry. So that's you know just making holes for individual agaves. I think uh, Doug was on hand a few years ago when we we did that in a plot of land in um, in in in, a, in a, a village like an hour and a half away from here, where we were just making holes and leaving everything else intact and. and, and and to be honest, I, I don't think it would hurt the plant in terms of reducing sunlight or having too much, uh, you know, competition by other 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 plants. Um, so I think as a as a as a as a practice, um, you know, as long as you don't have these huge trees that provide a lot of shade and thus would reduce like the sugar content of the agave, I think um, that 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 um, agroforestry approach is totally feasible. But then you have you have cultural norms to deal with. You have um, local town policies that demand that a piece of land be essentially deforested in order for you to have kind of claim to it. Uh, if you let it overgrow, then it may be susceptible to being passed on to another another land, another family. So I think you know there, there's this societal kind of uh, obstacles to, to like a larger scale uh, agroforestry approach. Um, but the good news, I had a, I had a really interesting experience um, a few weeks ago and it was, it was visiting a, um, a producer who's, whose father was like a, a behemoth of a producer in the, in the, let's say in the eighties and the nineties. And 
he essentially, you know, put his kids to work for him. And it was, you know, um, he was, it, production was really the name of the game. And this is when uh, Mesquila, uh, Mesquila, <laughs> Mezcal was really trying to become a Mesquila, like mirroring the ideas of tequila from the North and trying to take on, you know, those so-and-so modern practices of scalability and um, intensity. Um, and his, 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 you know, now his sons have their own palenques and they're doing their own things. And his son um, is, you know, was there, you know, I'd given him a bunch, he'd taken a bunch of tobala from the, um, from the nursery and he was planting them right next to his palenque in a, a, a grading slope. And he was just making holes for them one by one. And he was actually using the bagasso, which is the, the spent fibers from a, from a distillation as, as to cover the ground, like as a, as a skin, which is also something that, you know, I, I feel like agro industry has really done away with um, the practice of, of, of covering the ground. So as a means to constantly enter, you know, fertilizer and the need for um, herbicides into, into um, farmers practices. But it was, it was really interesting because here's a, the next generation essentially. And he was saying, you know, my, my father doesn't understand. My father just, he simply, he can't get this which was the practice of um, making individual holes, putting it in agave where there weren't trees and such in a very uniform, very like non-uniform, unsystematic way, but leaving all of the crops there and covering the ground. And, you know, and this producer clearly understood kind of the larger ecological circle. And I think his, his, for his father, it was totally abstract to his, to his father. You know, he was, he had no idea what he was doing. So, I think there's a lot of a lot of um, good signs, and I think there are a handful of small projects um, that are trying to do things the right way that are having positive influences on mescaleros. And the, the larger reality is that when um, mescaleros are getting more uh, for a liter of mezcal, it simply means that there's money left over to um, you know use for for ecological projects and such. So. Um, so yeah, there's there's certainly uh, you know a lot of a lot of positives to take from what's what's going on, um, and then and then yeah, and then one one other part I think the whole seed practice in terms of understanding biodiversity, that's been amazing how how quickly that's that's turned, um, and so I have a feeling that um, you know these 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 old practices are not nailed in because I don't think people are coming from this. They're not coming from a culture of efficiency and productivity and thus prying them away from those practices is, is not that difficult. Prying or just introducing other options, so. Mm, fantastic, thank you. So, you know, I have so many threads to pull on here, um, but you each given us a lot of food for thought. And um, I guess one thing really quick, you know, Alex, how can, people learn more about the work you're doing and, and to kind of pull on that thread and to connect with what you're doing? I mean, people can write to me. They can come visit the nursery. You know, I think, you know, it, it's, you know, it's reality is in, in, in person. So, and that, that's great. People do, people do visit. And I think, I think you need to have an experience. You know, I think Paco's here. I think Paco came down and, you know, of course, like, you know, these things as words and concepts in your head are one thing, but then to come down and to actually enter into the, you know, we were talking about the, the speed of things or the, 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 the patience of things or, or agave, uh, you know, step into that and let agave regulate you or step into a milpa and let, let it regulate you and then you'll feel something. And I think that's the best way to learn. Obviously not everyone can come to, um, to Mexico, but I, I feel like um, I feel like the experience is really, you know, where um, a lot is uh, meant to be learned. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, there's a web page, you know, respiral.com, where I put up basic, you know, passages and entries, um, so they could check that out. If uh, yeah, fantastic. Juan, how about for you? How can we learn more about what you do? So you can you can visit the farm as well. It's always open except during the pandemic, <laughs> because well you know like bringing a potential disease to a rural place without a doctor is dangerous. Um, so maybe just 
let's wait a few more months now that all elderly people are vaccinated so hopefully in a few months we can again welcome as many people as want to come um, and also you can um, go to instagram or facebook and you can find del rincon grande and there you can see stories and info you can write me and my email is magaybelrincon at gmail.com or through the website fantastic Thank you. So, you know, just thinking locally here and this being the last uh, presentation with followed tomorrow night by Doug's tasting with, with Roberto is that there's a lot going on here. You know, the, we've connected <clears throat> to many things here, but I just wanna, you know, give his shout outs and I miss so many people, but the Hotel Congress, what Todd is doing with the Agave Heritage Fest, uh, Mission Garden and the Agave work that they're doing and that Jesus Garcia leads with the planting. Uh, Borderlands Restoration and the Colectivo Sonora that you heard about last week and the incredible restoration they're doing for Bacanora. Um, going San Javier Co-op Farm and the agave work they're, they're doing. We're actually doing a tour with them here of the agave fields on Tumamac tomorrow. Um, uh, Native Seed Search work, Jacob Butler's work um, with the um, Salt River Pima community and, and what he shared with us. I mean, I'm, that's just a handful of a, of a bushel of incredible work that's being done in, in our region. Uh, the, I feel like there's um, a momentum growing and it's on each of us to perpetuate this, right? It all connects to the designation of a, a UNESCO city of gastronomy. Why is that the case, right? It's because this culture permeates from across the border here in the borderlands, here in Southern Arizona, here in Tucson, uh, thousands of years of history and it's on us to, to move it forward and educating us this way. And, and, and the experiential piece that you mentioned, Alex, it's transformational. Um, and uh, and there's a, the great thing is there's a lot of opportunities even locally and then also in many other regions to, to get, get our hands dirty. So thank you each for taking the time to join us tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Uh, the link's on the website. Doug, you're gonna continue the conversation for us and, uh, and we look forward to it. Me too. So, see you, you guys. Tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you.